at. So let's turn in our Bibles to Numbers chapter 11. We're looking at Numbers 11 and 12. Title of our study, The Wages of Sin. One of the things you learn as you walk with the Lord is to not get too depressed if things are going bad because they will get better. And not to get too excited if things are going good because there'll always be some trial at some point in the future. And we see this played out in the book of Numbers, perhaps in Judges even better, but Numbers, we're going to see it and have a little bit already. Numbers 10, the last chapter, things were just going great. The, the, the children of Israel were on an ultimate high. They had spent a year plus about a month camped there at, at uh, Mount Sinai. They received the Ten Commandments and, and the, the tabernacle had been built. Everything had been donated for all the things within the tabernacle. And uh, anyway, they were all set up. They had instructions as to how they were to camp and how were they, they were to break camp, who would carry what and all those things. And we've been looking at them recently. Now, what happens is they have to leave with hearts filled with excitement because if you've been camped for over a year in the same place, and then finally, hey, we're moving out, but not just moving out, moving toward the land promised to their fathers and now to be inherited by them, or in this case, their children. So they head out for the promised land. They only go about three days and God says, let's just camp here in Paran for a little bit. And all of a sudden, all sorts of things go wrong. And so we read, Numbers 11.1, 1. now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. For the Lord heard it and his anger was aroused. So fire, the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. And the people cried out to Moses. And when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. So he called the name of the place Terabah. That means burning because the fire of the Lord had burned among them and the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. I titled this the wages of sin because even at the best of times, we're always prone to it. We're always tempted to do it. And here they have the greatest thing happening. They're headed where they need to go and where they They've been promised for generations they would ultimately live. And, uh, and so they, these guys start murmuring. They start complaining. And, and I wish I could say it's the only time it happens, but it comes up again and again. And you know what that makes me think? That God might think one or two, certainly not more than a few of you, might do this same thing now and then. You might murmur a bit. What's the difference in a murmur and a complaint? A murmur's under your breath. It just sounds like what it is. What? But a complaint, no, that's out in the open. That's verbal. It's, it's everybody hears it. And, and I find it, well, just what you'd expect, really. It displeased the Lord. If you don't know that complaining is something God hates, We'll catch that tonight. It displeased him and he heard it and his anger was aroused. We read it also. He burnt those guys just as he had burnt Nadab and Abihu for offering profane fire some time back. Well, they did the right thing after they cried to Moses. Moses does what he does best. He prays to the Lord because he has no power to stop this. But he does know the one who can. It's the one who brought it. He prays and the fire was quenched. I'm reminded every time I read of Moses interceding for them that we have an intercessor in heaven. We're going through Hebrews on the weekend. So we get to see Jesus there seated at the right hand of the Father on high, making intercessory prayers for us, offering intercessory prayers for us. So the mixed multitude, first time we read of them in this section, um, it says the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. 
It's an essential warning to us, as verse 1 mentions, the complaints began on the outskirts of the camp. That's something that you might, you know, read or, or, or not really notice, but the outskirts of the camp. Why is that important? Because we saw recently that the tribes were arranged around Judah's standard and Reuben's standard and, and um, Ephraim's standard and then uh, Dan's standard. And, and there were three tribes in it to the east and the west and the south and the north. And with all of that, these who would be on the outskirts, they would be the mixed multitude. It just makes sense. Why? They're not a part of any of the tribes. These are those who came out of Egypt because Egypt had been destroyed by Pharaoh's stupidity and, and his refusal to let God's people go. The place was a wreck. And so people are like, hey, they're leaving. We're with them. And here's the problem. They were with them, but they were not of them. They went out with them, but they didn't really walk in fellowship with them. So what happens is the complaints start out there. That, this is a good picture for us because out there today wouldn't be, you know, the outside of the camp. It would be mixed media or just regular media or just, you know, people that you run into because the mixed multitude is always complaining about something. And uh, they're, they're going to bring down God's wrath at some point and it will be on them. But all of that to say that God's people, and they're, they're, this is so, so important to get this picture. Hey, can, are you still up there? No? Uh, see, see if you can find it, Rob, that picture of the camp. It's just always helpful. I mean, that's beautiful. I just wish I was there. But, but uh, the picture of the camp, if you can find it, and Rob's so good, he does so many things here. Um, if we paid him, we'd give him a raise. Um, <laughs> Anyway, why do I say that? Oh, yeah, killing time while, we, while he tries to find that. Well, listen, while he looks for it, even if he doesn't find it, here's what's so important to get. There were those among the children of Israel that were closest to those who were furthest from the tabernacle itself. If you were on the outside of the camp, you were nowhere near the tabernacle. If you were on the inside of the camp, you could actually see the, the, the cloud by day and the fire by night. You could know God was present, but the further out you got from God's throne, and that's what that was at that point, his earthly throne modeled after his throne in heaven, the further away you got, well, the, the, the harder it was to, to hear what was happening down there in the tabernacle and what God was saying to Moses and Moses was saying to the people. So I want to suggest that there's a picture here for us. And the picture is simple. That, that if you're far from the tabernacle of the Lord, if you, and that would be in this case, well, just wherever he is, gathering with his people, getting into his word, worshiping him because he has no earthly tabernacle except us. It's why we gather together. And, and so you, you do get it now and you can see it. If you're in, in with any of those tribes, you're close in. But those people that were uh, the mixed multitude, they weren't of any tribe. So they were way around the periphery. And the point I'm trying to make is if you were out nearest to them, you had more chance of hearing what they were doing and even joining in than hearing what God was saying and worshiping him. And that's happening today for a lot of people. They're getting, they're hearing too many voices saying too many things that just aren't so. And the more you listen to complaints, the more you feel like complaining. At least that's how I feel. But, uh, and we'll find out I'm not the only one because Moses kind of has a, a little thing that he goes through here too. So anyway, it was the mixed multitude in the outskirts of the camp, last part of verse one, the mixed multitudes, first part of verse four, who were among them, they yielded to intense craving. But we're going to find that the Israelites, they join in. So when it says the people complained, it doesn't just mean those on the outside. It means some of those at any point, but I'm thinking for practical reasons, those furthest from the, the 
cloud and the fire and the tabernacle and the sacrifices and all that went on there in the tabernacle, well, they were the most um, in danger, if you will. So um, there were some things though, though the mixed multitude camped on the outskirts far from God's presence, they could still experience his blessings. Why? They were traveling with the people that were actually the people of God. They had guidance by the cloud. They had manna from heaven. They had water from the rock. And they were like goats among the sheep. They were with them, but not of them. And they were the first to yield to intense craving. That phrase means the lust of the flesh. And we'll get to see the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life fleshed out for us, if you will, in these two chapters tonight. So the children of Israel, latter part of verse four, it says, also wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic apologies if you haven't had dinner. This just sounds so good and refreshing. Cucumbers, melons, leeks, spicy onions and garlic. But now they say our whole being is dried up and there is nothing except this manna before our eyes. They're already starting to complain about God's miraculous, gracious, perfect provision for them. It appeared every morning, except when he wanted them to have a day off and he'd give them double on the day before so they could have a Sabbath and rest. And all they had to do was get up and gather it. But we're gonna find out some things about manna in this chapter that we haven't read up to this point. So here's their, their question. Who will give us meat to eat? Listen, there's only one who could. And uh, better, you know, the, the, somewhere we read, uh, if you lack, ask, right? He who asks receives. He who knocks, the door will be open. Uh, he who seeks will find. He who knocks, the door will be open. And, and, and so the whole point is the only one who could have provided for them would be God. And all they had to do was ask, Lord, we're hungry down here. Well, they've been doing that. They were like, Lord, we're hungry. That's why he gave them the manna. And then Lord, we're thirsty. And he gave them water from the rock. He wasn't angry about them sharing their needs with him, but I don't think he appreciates them weeping and accusing him and acting like, well, there's no one to really take care of us out here. If it weren't for him, they would all be dead already. So they ask who will give us meat to eat. The memories of better days in Egypt are troubling as they fail to recall their suffering and abuse at the hands of Pharaoh. Now, because it says the children of Israel wept again, that means they're the ones saying this. And, and I'm thinking, well, we're capable of doing this. We don't all do it, but sometimes we'll run into an old friend from the, the old days and we'll begin to reminisce about the things we did in those days. And, and the conversation can turn in such a way that pretty soon we're glorifying things we, we, that just devastated us that we were on our knees praying for God to forgive us and cleanse us and free us from cleanse us of and free us from. And now we're talking like those were the good old days. Listen, if those were the good old days, why are we here like this now? Why aren't we still living like that? Because those days weren't good. And, and these guys were slaves and the, their slavery was bitter. And so they fail to focus on the fullness of what God had delivered them from. And all they... Remember, is the, the things that they enjoyed back in their times of slavery to Pharaoh. And so it is dangerous to look back longingly on a sin, but they do it again 
and again and again. Their mention of manna will not be the last. I was tempted to show you an even worse one, but it's only chapters ahead, and you can read ahead if you're curious, and I encourage it anyway. But um, we'll, we'll just leave what we learn about manna to what's here today. All I want to say is, as bad as this is, it gets worse in the future. So uh, I don't know if that's really a good way to, to encourage you to read forward. But um, now the manna we read, verse 7, we didn't have this information before, by the way, was like coriander seed. Its color was like the color of bedlam. People went about and gathered it and ground it on millstones or beat it in the mortar, cooked it in pans, made cakes of it. Its taste was like the taste of pastry. Now I really wish I had more than a quesadilla. Its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. And when the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna fell on it. Listen, God will graciously provide this manna for 40 years, for an entire generation. It gave them perfect nourishment in the wilderness, and yet they end up complaining about it. And I like the description here because without this, you just end up with, you know, guessing something or silliness like they had manicotti and banana pancakes. And, but now that I read this, like the taste of pastry. Maybe they were banana pancakes. Anyway, verse 10 says, Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Moses also was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Lord, why have you afflicted your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they weep all over me saying, give us meat that we may eat. But I'm not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. And if I found favor in your sight, do not let me see my wretchedness. You know what's interesting about this? The people complain and God starts wiping them out. Moses' complaints are met with compassion. And I think there's a good reason for that. God looks on the heart. And he knows if you're just having a bad day and you're like, bummer. Or if you're just, you know, complaining all over people and wrecking their day too. And so the, the, those who complain against him directly, well, God dealt with them harshly. But Moses, his complaints met with compassion because God knows what he's saying is true that this is too much for any man, even a man like Moses. So God's looking on him as he looks on us, by the way, with compassion. He knows what's going on in Moses. And so he decides he'll take care of it. Now, God always knew what he would do, but this just sets the stage for a couple of things that God planned and, and now will initiate and put into practice. It says a wind, verse 31, went out from the Lord and it brought quail from the sea. And, um, oh, wait a minute. I jumped way ahead, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, you're like, hey, you can tell me, hey, what happened to verse 11? That's what happens when you type the whole thing out and you have it on pages. Well, anyway, now you know my secret. Okay, so I'm, uh, you're, you're right there in the Bible. I have that too. Uh, and we're like up to verse 16. Does that sound right? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Caught it just in time. I thought, what? A wind from the Lord. Maybe, maybe he spoke to me in that moment. Well, the Lord said to Moses, gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle meeting that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and talk with you there and I'll take of the spirit that is upon you. And we'll put the same upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you may not bear it by 
yourself alone. I like this. God's just saying, hey, I understand what's happening with you, Moses. I know how you feel and I feel for you and I have a solution to this problem. He doesn't have an attitude when we come to him saying, hey, this is just more than I can bear. I, I, can't, I can't bear this. He, he comes alongside. He's like, yoke yourself to me. My burdens are easy. I mean, my, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You'll find rest for your soul. And so here he gathers a group of godly men, elders and officers that were already known among the people to be that. They weren't putting them through some training or some testing. They'd already identified them. They were already doing the work. So Moses' concerns here, we find, are in keeping with his earlier question. When God first chose him, do you remember? He, he said, who am I that I should deliver the people of Israel? And, and listen, who are you, Moses? You're nobody. He, and and he, he knew that. God said, I will be with you. And here he's saying, how can I feed all these people? The answer is the same. He doesn't have to say it. It's just true. I will be with you. So whatever you're facing and whatever comes soon or later, know this. If God was with you going into it, if you're walking with him today, you keep walking with him. When that trial comes or that test comes, well, he'll be with you. Jesus said, he'll never leave us or forsake us. I love that. We can be secure in him because we have been sealed with his Holy Spirit. That seal is the proof of ownership. We belong to him. We were bought with the precious blood of Jesus, bought at that oh so high price. We were so valuable to him that that he was the only one in the universe that could actually afford us. I like that thought. Got it from my little brother, Tony. Well, anyway, Moses concerns, who am I? How can I? And God just says, I'll be with you. That's true for me. It's true for you. And having dealt with Moses' concern, basically he just says, uh, well, let's talk about these people craving meat. Well, two quick things, though, before we jump to it. The spirit that is upon you, I will put the same upon them. I like this. Moses isn't in any way diminished by God surrounding him with godly men, empowered with the same power that was empowering him. No, now, now the, the burden is lighter and, and the, the workers are many. And basically their job would be and Moses' father-in-law had told him a long time ago, you got to do something about this because people would come and stand all day long waiting to talk to Moses to settle the dispute or to find out what does the law mean when it says this. So these guys are going to be assisting him by doing the exact same thing. So because there are, are 70 of them and there are only um, 12 tribes, they're going to be spread out among the tribes. People don't have to travel as far. They didn't have to wait in such a long line. And Moses didn't have to answer every question. It's a really good formula for success. Well, anyway, verse 18, and that's where we are. He says, then you shall say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow you shall eat meat. Sounds like such good news when they first hear it. They were probably jumping up and down and woohoo and all that stuff. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord saying, who will give us meat to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat and you shall eat. You shall eat not one day or two days or five days or 10 days or 20 days, but for a whole month. And then it gets scary until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you because you have despised the Lord who is among you and have wept before him saying, why did we ever come up out of Egypt? And the answer, by the way, God will always provide for his own. And he provides for those who are with his own. You may or may not be a believer in Christ, but everything he has for us, you get freely tonight. And if you 
give your life to him, well, there's just so much more that you can't even conceive of or begin to imagine until you actually surrender and let him have his way in your life. So all of this reminds us that Moses has seen so much and he's been right in the middle of it, but he still has questions and doubts about it. And what's, what happens is he's kind of dealing with Moses and then he's talking to the people. Now he's dealing with Moses again because Moses, hey, hey, I have questions. And then it's more with the people. But what he's just said is, is a serious threat. Well, it's not actually a threat. It's a promise of things to come. They're going to have more quail than they could ever eat, but it's not going to go well with them. There's a passage that, that I don't want to forget to share, and, 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 it, and it says, they, he gave them the request, but sent leanness to their soul. And, and uh, that's what's one of the things that happens. It doesn't say it in this particular passage we're reading tonight, but I wanted to make sure I said it because we're not all about, hey, we need this meat or we need that, but, but he can give you what you're asking for. And at the same time, that just brings leanness to your soul. Why? Because they weren't trusting in the Lord or relying on him or just waiting to see what he had for them. They were complaining about what he'd provided and saying, here's what we want and what we need. Now, Moses is still tripping because sort of like the disciples when the crowds had gathered and they didn't know how they were going to feed them. And they're saying, maybe we should send them away. And they're, they're, one of them's doing the math. And you know that whole story. Well, Moses says, the people whom I am among are 600,000 men on foot. That's the soldiers, by the way, 600,000 plus. There's 2.5 million of them out there. And you said, I, have, I will give them meat that they can eat for a whole month. Shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to provide enough for them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to provide enough for them? This is one of those places where I'm just glad he asked. You know, it's like when Thomas says, so, you know, we don't know where you're going. How, how could we know? Or, or when he, whatever he says, he'll always have some question, something that comes up that, hey, we're a little bit confused about this. And that's what's going on here. He's just saying, listen, as I compute it, this is impossible. You would think Moses would be comfortable with the impossible by now. I mean, he was directly involved in the 10 plagues that came, even the Passover. And, and, and he had been a part of receiving the law on the mountain and survived so many things. He has to know there's nothing too hard for the Lord. But again, Moses is just not sure. And so it's first things first. God's not finished with Moses. And uh, well, he has some things to say. So he says in verse 23, the Lord says to Moses, has the Lord's arm been shortened? Now you shall see whether what I say will happen to you or not. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. He gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people, placed them around the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took the spirit that was upon him and placed it the same upon the 70 elders. And it happened when the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied, although they never did so again. I made mention of it. I did it early, but didn't, wasn't thinking, oh yeah, that happens later. Moses' anointing and power isn't diminished at all. He's the same guy with the same calling and the same position, the same power. But now he has a crew of people with the same spirit that was on him. And listen, that's what the church is all about. It's about finding people, bringing them in, sharing the Lord with them, either here in your home, the restaurant where you are, wherever you are, sharing the Lord, leading them to Christ, and then watching God transform them and empower them and use their lives to continue that same work. So the two men had remained in the camp, verse 26. The name of one was Eldad and the other was Medad. 
I like that. It's sort of like El's dad and my dad. But anyway, the spirit rested upon them. They were among those listed, but who had not gone out to the tabernacle, yet they prophesied in the camp. Now, there could only be a couple reasons for them not showing up at the tabernacle. One, they might have somehow been defiled if you went near a dead body or, well, we've looked at this multiple times, so many ways to get defiled, only one way to get clean. So whatever kept them away, God still poured his spirit out on them. Why? Because he said 70. He didn't say, well, we only got 68. I'll pour my spirit on 68. Poured out his spirit on the 70. And two of them weren't with the others. And so they started just prophesying. That prophesying, by the way, was the spirit came upon them and they began to, to speak for the Lord. And we see the same thing so many times in the New Testament. Uh, and and we will see it again and again here in the Old as God's spirit comes upon someone and, and they prophesy. But in this case, they only prophesy once, but the anointing will be there to answer questions, to de settle disputes, to clarify the law, to do whatever and everything that comes up so that they can assist Moses and bless God's people who are there among them. Well, anyway, a young man ran and told Moses, Elad and Edad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. So Joshua, the son of Nun, doesn't mean he doesn't have a mom. It doesn't mean that she's a nun. It just means that's her name. She, she, he's the son of Nun. Moses' assistant, one of his choice men, answered and said, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. Now, I like Joshua a lot. He's one of two men that'll actually make it into the promised land of those of military age at this point. Two out of over 600,000 men. But he is thinking about Moses. And, and so he's like, my Lord, forbid him. Tell him to stop. And Moses said to him, are you zealous for my sake? Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And Moses returned to the camp, he and the elders of Israel. I love this. Moses' mindset, Moses' heart is, is one of humility and he gets it. Hey, if the Lord put his spirit on everyone, everyone would be fine. But at this point, you have someone who's watching out for Moses when Moses already has God doing that. And so Joshua's, you know, his intentions are good. This can happen to any of us. And he's like, hey, you should make sure that stops. And, and Moses is like, hey, this would be great. It's, I'm happy it's happening. And I wish everybody was doing it. Well, John the Baptist will show that he has that exact same attitude. It's a heart of humility, of meekness, that real meekness. And, and, and so when the crowds begin to leave to follow Jesus, after he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, you would think some of his disciples would say, well, we should be going with him. John was fine with that. And when this, his followers start saying, hey, we're losing the crowds. They're all going to Jesus. What does he say? He says, he must increase. And he understands for that to happen, I must decrease. And I share that with you because that's true of us as well. For Jesus to do more through me, there needs to be less of me. You know, the me who's always been here, the, the me who wrestles against the spirit, the flesh that's still a part of me. That me. Paul says, I reckon that man dead. And he says, we should reckon the old man dead. But the reality is to reckon means to, to act as if that were reality, to, to adopt that as your, as your new, new reality. And, and so we must reckon the old man dead. We need to live as if the flesh is no longer leading or guiding or even messing with us, although it will always be at war with the spirit till we stand before the Lord and are perfected. He must increase, but I must decrease. Well, you know, Jesus was meek and humble as well. And, and so uh, we, we, and I like how this, this 
chapter plays out because it kind of goes from this group to that group and it goes from this scene and then back to that scene, sort of like a little flashback to here and over there. Well, verse 31, what did he promise? Quail, a wind went out from the Lord and it brought quail from the sea and left them fluttering near the camp about a day's journey on this side and about a day's journey on the other side. Let me just say that's a lot of quail. If you could walk a day, because that's how they traveled. If you could walk a day in this direction and your buddy goes a day in that direction, that's, that's how many quail there were at that point. And he said he was going to feed them all and provide more than what they needed. And certainly he's about to do that. The other thing, it, it says um, the, about a day's journey on this side, a day's journey on the other, and all around the camp, about two cubits. Now, two cubits would be three feet high. A cubit's about 18 inches. They say it's a distance from your elbow to the tip of your fingers. I don't know how that works if you get me and Shaquille O'Neal next to each other, because his will be up here, you know. But uh, we could never build together. And so uh, that's why I don't hang with him. But besides, I never met him and never will and don't care. But and just an illustration. So so what, what it is is three feet above the, the surface of the ground. And the people stayed up all that day, all night, and all the next day and gathered the quail. And he who gathered least gathered 10 homers. Now, I will refrain from saying this is yet another reference to baseball in the scripture after we have, well, it's too late to, to refrain from it. But uh, I meant to refrain from it. That was the thought. It's not in my notes, so there was no good reason to share it. But uh, back in Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Here they get 10 homers, the one who gathers least or the one who gathers, uh, you know, there's people getting more than 10 homers. Now, homer three to six bushels. So if you're not talking about a good day for batters and a bad day for pitchers, then we really are talking about, man, that is a lot of quail. And, and the first question that came to my mind is, well, how do they keep them from going bad? If you've got three to six bushels of them, well, they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. And we know that they would, they would um, they'd bleed them. They would, they would lay them out, you know, fillet them. Well, you fillet fish. I don't do quail, so Bud knows. But uh, anyway, you, they'd open them up. They would salt them. They'd leave them out there and... Apparently, the things would stay good for a season. Um, in any case, it says he spread them out for themselves all around the camp. But, and whenever you're getting really good news and somebody says, but, or you have really bad news and they say, but, you know something's about to change. But while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was aroused against the people and the Lord struck the people with a very great plague. So he called the name of that place Kirbroth Hatava. That means the graves of greediness. Yeah. So where did you meet your girlfriend? Ah, oh, graves of greediness. You know, we survived it. But yeah, it's just, you know, that just, it's, to read those words means nothing to us. But to know that they named the place the graves of greediness. Why? Because there they buried the people who'd yielded to craving. From Kirbath Hatava, the people moved to Hazareth and camped at Hazareth. So let me just say, in chapter 12, is very short. We'll get through it quickly. We'll worship again. But let me say, for any, as we're moving on, any of you who might be prone to murmur or complain, there's homework for you tonight. Read 1 Corinthians 10 before you go to bed. Make a mental note now or jot it down or put it in your notepad, uh, whatever you need to do, but make sure, but, but only if you've ever been guilty of murmuring or complaining. If you're one that never murmurs or complains, well, you're probably married to somebody who does those, so you can read 1 Corinthians 10 to them. Numbers 12, we learn this. Envy, pride, prejudice, presumption, selfish ambition, they're all serious sins in the sight of God. And as bad as it was for Moses to have the camp rebelling against God and against him and accusing him, this is worse. Why? This is family. This is his big sister, Miriam, and his big brother, Aaron, 
Moses is the baby in the family. And this is them speaking against him. Well, that's what we read. Miriam and Aaron, so she's the ringleader here. Remember that, it's important to the story. They spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he'd married, for he'd married an Ethiopian woman. We know this happened some time back, but all of a sudden it's bugging them. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us too? And the Lord heard it. And this man, Moses, was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. I put in my notes, until Jesus. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out you to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. I picture that scene in The Wizard of Oz where they're shaking and Oz is back there, right? I mean, they just have to be freaking out completely. They go forward, and then he said, Hear now my words, if there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him. How? In a vision? Or I speak to him in a dream, but not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? It's important for later as we get into the prophetic books to understand that visions and dreams both required interpretation. So even when a prophet had the first, he needed the second. But God didn't speak that way to Moses. He just talked to him face to face, friend to friend. He treated him like a a friend. He calls him his servant. And I like that because that's exactly what Moses was. You know, the disciples saw the glory of the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus um, you know, transfigured before their eyes. And, and John, of course, writes that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. But we know that the, the scripture says, no man can see my face and live. And, and yet this is the second or third time and we're only in the fourth book of the Old Testament where, where God has made an exception. And, and he's like, hey, at one point he tells Moses, I'm gonna put you in the cleft of the rock and I'll pass by. I'll let you see my back, backside as I go or something. And, and it's like, and then he proclaims the name of the Lord. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage, a beautiful revelation of God, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and compassionate. And, and it's just, you should find it and read it. I didn't jot down where it was and off the top of my head tonight, I don't know. But what's so important here is that that Moses saw the Lord and the Lord met with him and talked right to him. And now we hear again, not the first time, not the second, and won't be the last. The anger of the Lord was aroused this time just against Miriam and Aaron. Now they know what he'd done to everybody else. They had to be freaking. And so he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous as white as snow. And Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, a leper. Couple questions come to mind. Why her and not him? She was the instigator. She was the leader. How do we know? Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. If it was Aaron and Miriam, it would be written that way. That's just how they communicated. So this was her saying, hey, little brother's getting too big for his britches. We need to bring him down a notch. It turns out that was a really bad idea. And so now she's leprous. Leprous means you're going to get out of the camp and no one's going to want to associate with you. They, they call the lepers the walking dead. And so um, anyway, Aaron knows there's nothing he can do about this. So he goes straight to Moses and he says, oh my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly, in which we have sinned. And I want to say that word we is huge here because he could have just said, you know what she did and she deserves it, but please have mercy on her. No, he associates and rightly so because he was involved. But we'll find many places in scripture where one making intercession, especially for the nation, 
will say, we have done and we have done and we've turned away and we've been foolish because they're identifying, even if they weren't guilty of it, they're identifying with God's people who were guilty of it. Because for my brother to suffer, I suffer. For, for my family to suffer, I suffer. So it, it's, it's one thing in the minds of, of each of them. So Moses cries out to the Lord because Moses can't do anything about this. So Aaron says to Moses, don't lay the sin on us in which we've done foolishly, in which we've sinned. Please don't let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, please heal her, O God, I pray. That's an example for us. When somebody burns us and then something bad happens to them, you don't rejoice in that. And if you do, that's just human nature, is to actually take a little, well, good for them. They got theirs. But that's not the heart of God. And Moses gets that. And, and, and so Aaron's pleading to Moses, and Moses is pleading with the Lord. It's an example for us. Please heal her, oh God, I pray. Moses was the one offended. And, and now he's praying for the one who offended him, who tried to undermine him, who tried to say he was taking more on himself than he should have. And, and again, an example for us. Wherever there's bad examples, we're to note them and avoid them. Where there's good examples, we're to note them and follow them. Then the Lord said to Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, would she not be shamed seven days? That sounds weird to me. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, somehow that this is one of the many things they did that are unexplainable to me. But if a daughter did something that just defiled her and, you know, was a bad for the family's reputation and such, sometimes they would do that. I, I don't, I actually never have read, though, in Scripture. I've only read commentaries where it says this was common. But they have to say it's common because he's mentioning it. But now that I think of it, if you find it, let me know. Cup of coffee on me. Um, don't look now, though, because I don't have any money. But uh, if her father had spit in her face, would she not be shamed seven days? Would she not be shut out of the camp seven days? And afterwards, she may be received again. So Miriam was shut out of the camp for seven days. And the people did not journey till Miriam was brought in again. There's something here. It's small, but it's big. And that is... That the sin of one person in the camp, and remember, 2.5 million people there, it hinders the progress of the whole camp. We're just the body of Christ. But when I sin or you sin, when we're involved in something we shouldn't be, or we just misrepresent him in our attitude or our mindset or, or, or the way we act toward people, that hinders the work that Jesus is trying to do here in our midst, in our community. So her sin stops them all. They have to wait a week before they can move on. And you can bet they're like, man, there's so much of that meat still piled and it's starting to reek and we need to get out of here. But now they're all stuck because of what she'd done. Afterward, the people moved from Hazroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Well, a couple things and they're important and uh, we'll, we'll conclude with them. Our study on the wages of sin would be incomplete without a proper conclusion. Chapters 11 and 12 remind us that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, while common to all, they're deadly sins. God judges them. Chapter 11 was a warning as well to those traveling with, but not a part of God's flock his family, his fellowship. If that's you tonight, if you're with us but not of us, well, we welcome you and we're glad you're traveling with us. But we want you to become one of us, to know God's forgiveness, to know that God sent his son Jesus to die for our sins. He was buried and he rose again. There's forgiveness and everlasting life in him. We who receive that, we're being transformed and we're growing and we're becoming more like Jesus. And if you're here because a friend of yours, you see that happening in them? Man, you want that same Jesus. You need that same Jesus. So 
So the, the problem started on the periphery, but, but it moved in. And so there's, there's something for the one who's just traveling with us, but isn't one of us. And then there's something for those of us who are with us, but kind of on the, the, the periphery of the whole thing. Man, pull in, get close to the throne, get close to the Lord, get close to him. So, so that when all the nonsense is being shared out there, you don't get caught up in it. You don't end up saying the same thing as those who don't know the Lord or know of him but despise and hate him. The things they're saying, man, you don't want those to ever come out of your mouth. So it's a reminder of, in chapter 12 that promotion doesn't come from the east or the west, but from the Lord. Moses was in the position he was in because God chose him to lead the nation of Israel. He didn't choose them. Together, they're the three stooges. But part, that's Moses, the leader of God's people. And, and listen, I'm not trying to denigrate uh, you know, Aaron just because he made the golden calf or, or Miriam just because she challenged Moses and had to turn into a leper for a week. I'm just saying that's sort of an indication of why he picked Moses and not them. But in any case, your position, your place, your purpose in the body of Christ, it is all of him. Your calling, your gifts, they're all of him. Finally, I believe you are as close to God tonight as you want to be. If, if you're saying, no, I, I want to be closer, well, then draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. But I do believe it. If you're way out here and God's right here, all you need to do is draw in because he wants a more intimate, more radical, more perfect relationship with you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these oh so practical chapters. And Lord, I, I'm grateful that for, for some of the passages we come through and the, the difficulties of them, that Lord, you continued to draw us together to worship and to study. And Lord, you know I'm committed to go through the whole word of God because it contains the whole counsel of God. And when I stand before you, I want to be able to say as Paul, I have not shunned to declare the whole counsel of God. And I'm convinced that in these pages, these, these Old Testament stories and, and histories, the things that your people went through, the, the success they experienced and the failures they experienced, they're all lessons for us, Lord. So teach us through them and, and help us understand them. And Lord, we pray that you will draw each of us closer. If it's true that we're as close as we want to be, we're saying right now we want to be closer. We want to sense your presence. We, we want to know your pleasure. And Lord, if there be any or many tonight who never said, Jesus, come into my life, forgive my every sin, be my Lord and Savior. Listen, the day I gave my life to the Lord, I was the only one who responded to that invitation. And in the first months I walked with the Lord, I asked so many people, do you want to give your life to the Lord Jesus? And I never got the response I was praying for or hoping for. And when I finally did, I was shocked. Really? You do? And I want to say to you, I never tire of saying, do you want to give your life to the one who died for your sin, was buried and rose again? Do you want to give your life to the one who gave his life for you? Who wants you to have the life he's intended and purposed and planned? All the good he has for you. It's in his son, Christ Jesus. But you have to surrender to him. You have to confess that you are in need of his forgiveness, that you're a guilty sinner, no worse and no better than anyone else, just a sinner like everyone else. And if you're ready to give your life tonight and you've never done it before, I'd ask you to raise your hand and hold it high. And what am I gonna do? Awesome, I see your hand there, brother. Wonderful. Anybody else wanna join this brother and say, I wanna pray too. I wanna give my life to the Lord. Anybody else? Listen, most important decision you will ever make in your entire life. And you can put your hand down. I, I know we're going to pray together in a moment. I don't want you to have to keep it up all that time. So anybody else though, don't let this opportunity pass. Consider it. Going out for you personally, this invitation, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Anyone else? You who raised your hand, pray these simple words after me. 
you confess the Lord with your, your, your mouth, you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. So pray these words after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me, for choosing me, for drawing me, for convicting me of sin of my sin and convincing me of your love. I ask your forgiveness and for power to overcome the things that would keep me from you. And I give you my life that I could serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Let's welcome this brother into the family. Well done. Listen, we have a Bible for you. Please, when we're all done, come up. It's a little pocket Bible, but you can have it with you at all times, whether you have one or don't. It's so important to get you started. We don't want anything from you. We just have more for you. And so uh, let's stand for one last song together, you guys.